Okay, welcome to this exclusive interview with Mike Natali. He's the global leader of Ingredients plant-based proteins platform. Mike, welcome. Before we get going, could you just give me a quick rundown about Ingredion as a company and where it sits in the alternative proteins value chain? Hey, so thank you very much, Nick, for having me and for having Ingredion. We're uh, very excited to be here. Ingredion is you know, a really very, very exciting company. We have a lot of really cool things going on right now. And, you know, we're really a legacy business that has been in the food ingredient space for over a hundred plus years. And in that time, predominantly very strong with ingredients that, that revolve around carbohydrates. So starches and sweeteners. And our, our business goes back in many countries, United States, Canada, Mexico, even as far as Pakistan for for hundred plus years. So Legacy, you know, very, very strong with the food food ingredients chain, the agro business, specifically in, in different areas, in different uh, grains and pulses and vegetables like corn, potato, tapioca, and, and more recently into other ingredients like stevia. And then very recently, just in the last few years, we've made some very big investments around plant-based proteins. And so that's what I'm very excited to have a chance to tell you a little bit about what we've been up to in that space. But the plant-based protein offerings that Ingredient has is really the newest from our, our portfolio. And in many ways, some of the products I would say are some of the newest proteins offered in, in market by anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, today we're going to be focused on the, the, the current state of the plant-based industry, on consumer trends in the ingredient innovation space, on sustainability, which I know is incredibly important to you as a company, and also a big area for ingredients, sports, nutrition. Before that, though, um, we've got some general questions for you. Not a day goes past when I don't read a, on the wires somewhere some sort of news item or other declaring that plant-based has had its day. Tell me, as someone who works on the inside, how do you view what's going on in the industry and then what's your reaction to some of those reports? Yeah, Nick, you know, from, from Ingredients' perspective, you know, we, we really focus very closely on the data, the, the, the trends around what the consumer is asking for. We know that the, the consumer, this space has grown tremendously over the last five years, it's you're talking about the plant-based food space is better than uh, an eight billion dollar market that's out by the the PBFA. So and it's 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 had a, a, a you know a kager of better than you know 12, 13 percent over the last five years. So there's just been tremendous growth, and the, the the those numbers really speak for themselves. When it comes to the fast rise, if you will, this tech level rise and and maybe maybe let's say people doubting that that speed i would say that you know exponential growth in the food space i, I don't really think that any of us from our side ingredient anticipated exponential growth what we looked at was probably a better than 10 percent kager growth and it's settling in somewhere between six and eight percent currently so you know i think that it's it's uh, still very exciting. We know that the consumers, if you, if you look back to many of the, the reports that came out over the last two years, you know, many households were consuming plant-based protein offerings by better than 50% households. You know, that's to me a message of them wanting to experience these types of products. I will say though, that where you see some of that, the recent data where it has that down, we, we recognize that the experience was not a great experience. And so for us, that gives us, that that really makes us want to work even harder towards generation two, generation three, generation four products to deliver on the, the experience of really the flexitarian. You know, the, the vegan is, is, is very excited about the offerings, but the flexitarian, and that's someone very similar to myself, is looking for a, a, a full experience around flavor functionality and nutrition like they would get with some of their other day-to-day -day products. Mm -hmm. But I, I, would, I would say in general, I would say in general, you know, it's, 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 it is a little wild to read some of these, these, these articles there were, they were so positive and some of them are so negative. I think there's somewhere in between there. And, and I would say maybe some of it's a little bit of clickbait and maybe some of it, I'm not really sure where the source is coming from. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know about in the US, but uh, I think in the UK, the vegan 
uh, market makes up about one to three percent, and the flexitarian is about eleven to twelve to twelve percent. So we mustn't forget that this is a this is a nascent industry. It's in its infancy. It's going to take a lot to disrupt a sector that's had a head start running to, into decades and decades or even more. Yeah, I mean, Nick. So I I really always I I I see this day in day out. You know, being in the food space twenty plus years, I can remember two big trends that came out and were comparable to plant-based protein. Uh, the first was organic. And I'm not going to mention names, but there was some very large retailers that came out claiming some big promises and wanting to do some very big things with organic. That never really materialized. But nonetheless, organic has con- organic products have consistently grown and have grown certain grocers and retailers to be almost maybe 80 to 100% of their offering. So, you know, organic has been a massive, massive movement that, you know, saw a huge up, saw maybe a little bit of a correction, and then has seen somewhere between eight and 12 kicker growth over the last 10 years. And then I would say the other one that really always intrigues me is if you can remember, Nick, I, I, I you know, I'm, I don't know what our age is and how, how that all plays out, but I can clearly remember energy beverages coming to market in Europe. And I, I can I can clearly remember, you know, a lot of doubt from people that were probably a little bit older that didn't re- really understand what an er- energy beverage was, why would you consume it? But it it started off very niche and in niche niche uses and it just grew and it grew and it grew and it's become, you know, a, a better than few billion dollar market today and continues to grow with all types of different ingredients, nutraceuticals, uh, dietary, you know. So it's it's really one of those markets where it was very niche to begin. And as innovation has improved it with taste, with functionality, with nutrition, other segments, sub-segments of the market have adapted to to energy beverage as well. So I really, I really think that there's there's been so much focus on alternative meat with plant-based proteins that we many don't really see that it is a huge, huge play in alternative dairy and in snacking and in bakery. These three segments have just grown tremendously and snacking will continue to grow very large in this space. So, you know, alternative air, alternative meat is not just a burger. There's going to be a lot of other new innovations that come out that really deliver on the needs of the flexitarian and, and, and the vegan. So I think that we're very excited about the future. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the criticisms, rightly or wrongly, about plant-based, plant-based meats in particular is the number of ingredients and over-processing. Yeah. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I guess it comes down to, first off, how do we define over-processing? It's not like it doesn't exist in other sectors of protein. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a fair feedback. It's feedback that we we took very very for, you know front and center. Uh, you know it's it is about first developing the product and then it's about improving the product. You know the, again we go through Gen one development, Gen two development, Gen three development, getting that feedback. You know I would say that we also heard a tremendous amount around sodium, and you know we've done between you know clean label, which is where. Ingredient has invested, you know, last 30 plus years of our innovation and research around clean, clean label ingredients. We've heard that, that, uh, that feedback from the customer front and center. So we really look at when we formulate, how do we formulate with clean label ingredients? So ingredients that the consumer recognizes, and then how do we get to a level of ingredients that the consumer feels comfortable with? You know, so is it, is it, is it four, is it five? Is it six ingredients? We have to understand that. And so that's really where we've been focused on how do we do more with less with ingredients that are recognizable? And then ultimately, how do we deliver ingredients that are nutritious and comply or hit the goals for our consumer on their daily uh, nutritional intake? And so, Mm -hmm. you know, sodium became a big project for us over the last 24 months, lowering the sodium of uh, content for, for the proteins and for for other ingredients that we produce. And we've been very successful with those, those endeavors. So I think it's, it's a fair comment. I do believe, like you said, all of this is needs to be in the perspective of what you considered over-processed or processed. 
if you're eating a plant-based chicken nugget or a plant-based alternative meat nugget against a an animal, you know, a chicken nugget, that both of these are going to have some level of processing, some level of process. So I think it's just important to realize too and recognize that we are making food products to feed the world at some level. And there is a level of processing that does go into that. So it's, it's important to understand what, what level of over-process is the consumer looking for. Yeah. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. So in your opinion, what novel plant-based protein sources could emerge um, in the future as potential alternatives? I mean, we talked about plant-based and we'll mainly talk about plant-based here, but you probably keep your eyes on other breakthroughs in the sector. You know, Nick, it's interesting because I, when I when 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 I get that question, I think a little bit about we, you know, you being, let's say, Western Europe, myself being in the United States, Canada. When we think about those two regions, this whole plant based protein movement seems to be very, very new for us. It's, you know, we're very used to consuming red meat and chicken and uh, and seafood on a regular basis. But if you look at the rest of the world, if you look at regions like Africa, specifically Asia and South America, these are regions that have, have existed for thousands of years off of soy, off of wheat, off of beans and legumes. And so these parts of the world, really, it's, it is very, it is not a novel idea, plant-based proteins. But for us in you know, the Western world, Western Europe, the United States, Canada, We've been we've had diets that really are are predominantly around red meats and 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 animal types of proteins. And so, when 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 we look at what's next, we really look at potentially even what what other cultures are consuming for many years that would be appropriate for delivery for the United States, Canada, and Western Europe. And so, you know, we've done a tremendous amount of research in the legumes space. And, you know, I would say yellow pea, I'm just going to kind of go down the list. Yellow pea has been one that maybe many people have heard about over the last five, 10 years, but that's because, you know, you can really, you can get upwards of 24, 25% protein from one little yellow pea. It's one of the highest dry percentage basis vegetables for protein anywhere in the world. So yellow pea has got a tremendous amount of protein. And in fact, most of our farmers anywhere in the world, they feed their 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 cattle or their 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 pigs a lot of, of yellow pea to get that protein. And so yellow pea is one that's it's not new, but there's some challenges with yellow pea. There's some challenges when it comes to taste, very earthy and sulfury level flavors. But we've done outside of just yellow pea, we've gone into three other pulses that we really think are the next future for for the, the space. We look at fava and many in the United States do not recognize fava at all. Some parts of Europe, Eastern Europe, around the Mediterranean, fava is recognized. Middle East, Northern Africa, fava is recognized. And it's recognized because it has outstanding levels of protein, very high levels of protein um, with almost no flavor and almost no color. And you may say, well, why does color matter? Color does matter when you're going into a yogurt, when you're going into potentially an alternative meat like a chicken or, 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 or fish. So color is very important and it has outstanding macronutrient aspects of it as well. So, you know, fava is, 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 is a, a pulse that we are producing out of Western Canada, out of our facility up in Banskoy. And we have just really started the, the discussions with our customers on fava, but they're already putting in this, these products into applications and getting very excited about what, what the future begins with that. Also, I would say lentil and lentil is very recognizable. So the last two here are very recognizable, but we're doing some great work with lentil and there's some awesome, really awesome products that are already being made. I'm not going to mention the names of them, but one product a very good customer of ours is making just an outstanding, let's say, rice product, if you will, and just doing tremendous things with this, being able to form it, high levels of protein, very little flavor, and people recognize lentil and the importance of lentil in their day-to-day -day diet. And lastly, 
I would say chickpea. And we all recognize chickpea. We've all, for the most part, had hummus. Uh, it is a delicious dessert or appetizer. It's a, a part of the condiments that we eat and consume all the time. But chickpea, by, by nature, has an element that's very challenging because there's a, a process of defatting that you have to do with chickpea. We've partnered very closely with a, a great group out of Israel called Anova Pro. And they have a tremendous technology to be able to produce a high level protein, better than 70% chickpea, as we call it, a chickpea isolate. And it really is at this point, we're, we're just beginning with some of the top customers, enabling chickpea to be used in all kinds of applications going forward. You're going to see chickpea and cream cheeses. You're going to see chickpea in different types of bakery snacks like cookies and breads. You're going to see chickpea in all different types of alternative meats because it is just so recognizable. When the consumer sees chickpea, they get excited. It has just a perfect flavor and it delivers high levels of nutritious protein. So we just see those three proteins as the next, next three years. And we're already working on what's to come after that. But that, that is our, our pipeline for the next three years. Well, I mean, if uh, you can make a delicious ice cream from algae, then you know, why not? Why not focus on these things? Now, something you said in our prequel was that flavor is king, which yeah. I, I really liked. I mean, could you explain how at Ingredion, the products you make address that important criteria for consumerism? Is there anything, uh, but I know there's something innovative that you're doing to eliminate those certain off notes, I guess you call them, don't you? Yeah. Certain... Hey, Nick, it's a great question. You know, I, I as I said prior in the introduction, I, I come from the flavor space from the flavor industry prior. And I, I, I was participating in a bunch of consumer studies and it was just amazing to see the consumer, you know, and let's think about our, our buying process as well. We first initially, we buy based off of two aspects, the being in the shopping grocery aisle, we pick up the product, we look at the, the, the packaging, we feel it and we look at the label, right? And that's really ultimately outside of price that that's what puts it in the, the shopping cart. The next time we experience that product is at the kitchen table. And so we, you know, we either, we either put it together in, in what we're going to consume for dinner or lunch, and then we, we taste it. Right. And so at that moment, whether it's the cooking process, when you see how it works functionally, or when you taste it, this is your, your second and third experience with, with the product. If it functionally does not work well, it just goes up or it, 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 it dissipates or it doesn't work well in, in the soup, you know, we get frustrated, right? We say, maybe I won't buy it again. We still give it a chance to taste it. If it does not taste well, though, I will tell you this, Nick, we'll never buy it again. Most likely mm -hmm. we'll never buy it again. And so the, the you know, the industry really has a, a goal. You want to say, okay, let's make it a great functionally, you know, it has to look good, it has to function but it has to taste great. It has to have that experience, the sensory experience that we all look for. And so for us, you know, you think about some of these, these products could be alternative meat, right? How has that experience been for the flexitarian? For the vegan, it's, they're very excited. Oh, this is amazing. I have, I have a alternative burger at every food service and QSR place in the world, which is exciting. That experience to be able to try it anywhere is amazing. Next step for our, our, our space. But it has to really deliver for that flexitarian. The, the person that wants their normal Angus burger to, to, to taste very similar to that plant burger, it really has to perform. Uh, it, cannot be, it cannot be, you know, gooey. It cannot have an off flavor. It, does, it can't, you know, fall apart in functional form. So, you know, really the flavor part of it is so critical. And so how we work, as Ed said, we talk about three things flavor, functionality, and nutrition, the, the flavor part of that is, is, is the first part, the first phase. And we have different aspects in our processing. So we actually have different ways that we can treat with heat, different ways that we can treat with what we call some of our, our flavor ingredients. So some of these ingredients, we actually, we, 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 we produce at some of our other facilities. And these can be ingredients from actual stevia. We can use ingredients from stevia. We can use ingredients from some of our, even our starch ingredients that can help with texture, 
that can help with flavor. And so for us, we really are on a quest for flavor is king and delivering the best protein to market is best flavor, best tasting protein to market is really fundamental to what we do. And so if you think about your experience with protein, if it, if it doesn't taste good, the likelihood that you're going to buy that again is probably uh, very low. So mm -hmm. we're really focused there, Nick. Yeah. We're going to move on to sustainability now. Now, I hear constantly the consumers are placing sustainability high when it comes to making purchasing decisions. What's the evidence to actually back that up? I believe you've been doing some some of your research there at um, Ingredion. Yeah, I, I think that, that sustainability, no doubt, is, as I had said, it gets the consumer very close to the brand. It, it At the end of the day, we talk about the, the purpose of, you know, of how people look at that uh, the the way that they consume now, and so they're they're realizing that you know a purpose driven product, a sustainable product is one that they want to assimilate their brand to, and so you know I think that that it's uh, sustainability is again it it's an important part of of getting people close to your brand, but you can have the greatest most sustainable product in the world. If it doesn't perform an experience, most likely it's going to be it's going to be very challenging for people to come back. Now, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be recognizable. You know, if you think about your first energy beverage experience, you you probably tasted it and thought, "Holy cow, what is this? This tastes so uniquely different. It's mm -hmm. it's foreign to me. I don't I don't know if I like it." But it was the it was the social aspects of the energy beverage that really brought people in said, wow, I, I really, this makes me feel cool. This makes me feel a part of a group or a community. And so it really brought a lot of people in. And so that's, that's where I'm kind of looking at this as well, is that it doesn't necessarily have to be something that, that the consumer recognizes the moment that they, that they experience it, but it does have to, you know, revolve around the, the, the general experience that they want to receive, which could be communal. It could be, you know, more, more, more than just the, 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 if you will, the taste. I think that there's some other aspects that, that will play into it as these new products are launched. But I think sustainability is, is, it's just, it's so important for the future of these brands that are operating in, in an aspect that are, are, you know, looking at the wellness of the planet. You know, we think about the plastic that's consumed. We think about, the, the energy that's used, the water that's used, um, all of these things, can we, can we do this better? Can we do this in a more sustainable practice? Can we do this better without, you know, the, you know, with, with better animal wellness? That's, that's critical. That's really important to, to everyone. Everyone's interested in animal wellness, not necessarily meaning, you know, we don't consume animal, but can we do it in a, in a more humane or can we do it in a better way? And so I think that that's, that's, that's important. I would also add one other thing about sustainability. It's a term that most people don't like to, to equate to sustainability, but it's one that has to be recognized. Is it sustainable by, by, by a measure of profitability? And this is important when you think about efficiencies. If it's efficient, most likely it's more sustainable than non-efficient process. And so, you know, we, we, we look at you know, from a from an efficiency standpoint for plant based proteins, is is consuming or processing a one gram of plant based protein more efficient than one gram of animal protein? We think about all of the the the, the you know the water that's used for animal protein. We think about all of the land that's used for animal protein. We think about all of the carbon emitted from animal protein. At the end of the day, you know, very little water is used in in our pulse, the uh, pulses that we grow. There's, you know, less than one tenth the 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 land is used, and it's it's carbon positive. And so overall, you know, I think that we look at the efficiencies for the future will come from plant based proteins as opposed to animal protein, and that's that's at the end of the day what what will win. What will win with in regards to the consumer when it comes to affordability? Mm -hmm. 
Now, I think during my research, I, I looked at um, your website and I checked some data from Atlas and apparently 40% of consumers check ingredients to identify um, sustainable products. The labeling around sustainable sourcing is therefore vital. Do you think the industry is doing enough in this regard? Well, I think it's an opportunity for everybody. Are we doing enough? I think that the the agro aspect of sustainability is probably the largest opportunity of all of them. I think that it's what most studies are showing. Can we do more? I, I think that it's it's a, a part of our DNA and ingredient to do more. Can others do more? I think that you know our our competitors recognize that as well. That the the future uh, consumer is asking for sustainable products. So again, I, I really believe the consumer is king. You know, the consumer is the one that 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 has the the, the power of the purse. And so what they're asking for, we listen. We listen very closely. And I will say that the consumer is asking for sustainable, nutritious products that deliver on an experience that they like. And that's that's really ultimately what we what we're geared towards. And I think that overall that's what the industry recognizes as well. Are we there yet? No, I think we can do a lot more, but we're on the path. And that's 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 important to start the journey. <laughs> And now I know from the webinar that we worked with you guys on at the start of the year that transparency is clearly a big driver for ingredient and your tie up with how good is proof of that. Could you tell me about uh, that a bit about that relationship and some of the results that it's yielded so far? Yeah, I think that that for us, you know, how good we're just at the start of this relationship and you know, we're very excited about, you know, we're really really I believe we are the first ingredient supplier to be working with how good in any capacity and how good is for the viewers that are that are listening it's you can you can search for them on you know on, on any of the search engines but ultimately it's a it's a group that helps us through a third party perspective understand how sustainable our ingredients are and so what they do is they go through they have a whole review of what they would do with our ingredients from the water usage the energy usage the carbon's emission, all of these aspects, they they review as for an individual ingredient, and they they really give us a sustainability score on each ingredient, and and subsequently, we can use that with our customer, the consumer products good companies, to show them the sustainable aspects of that ingredient, and what the consumer products goods companies like very much so is that they can then use that data to project the sustainability of their end product. And so we've had, we've already gone through, you know, a gamut of about 50 ingredients with, with how good. And, you know, we're going to, we we're a company with a thousand plus uh, ingredients for our portfolio. So we have a long ways to go there, but overall we're very excited about this relationship and our ability to understand, Hey, this product is very sustainable. This is why. Or it's not. And what do we have to do to get that better? We really look at, you know, maybe in the past, we look at our business as from a plant perspective, how many, you know, millions of pounds of water do we use a year or how many, you know, how much, how much energy are we consuming? How much carbon are we emitting? This is really cool because it says for the ingredient, what, what does that look like? And we can very, very quickly see hey, this ingredient, we can do a better job because X, Y, and Z, we think we can make that, we can we can reduce that and increase the efficiencies. And again, coming back, more sustainable. So we're using less energy, we're using less water. Well, what does that equate to? That equates to savings as well, right? So, you know, I think it, at the end of the day, sustainable practices is just good business. Mm -hmm. The demand for these products is forecast by pretty much everyone to grow in the future. I mean, what potential challenges do you foresee arising in terms of sourcing uh, and scaling to keep up with that yeah. demand? You know, it's a great question, Nick. And what people don't recognize is, is this. We have a, a food system that is very, very old, very, you know, driven by a lot of legacy ingredients like corn. You think about the amount of corn that's consumed in Europe, Western Europe, the United States and other parts of the world. We have these very old transport systems and, and, and you know, whether it's through a uh, train or it's through barges or it's through different elevator systems, all of this has been set up over 
50, 70, 100 years or more uh, to deliver our food to our table. We don't recognize, the consumer doesn't recognize how, how, you know, how tedious and how long our societies have developed these systems. But we're talking about a long time. And so when you have novel ingredients, new ingredients that come, come to play, like our pulses, like our yellow pea, our fava, our chickpea, our lentils, it's not just about can we produce the ingredient at our plant? It's really ultimately about do we have the supply chain that can deliver that ingredient as we scale with the consumer? So, you know, early days for yellow pea, it may be okay because we have enough farms to deliver on that. But where the demand has gone over the last 10 years, it has grown, it has grown exponentially. And so we've had to not just uh, add our network of, of growers, um, but add our network of freight providers, of the ability to manage the regulatory of what's coming in, to be able to manage the quality systems of the products that are being produced. And then what we forget about is that there's many financial institutions like the Chicago Board of Trade that historically for, for 100 plus years has regulated prices of commodities so that people understand where those prices of commodities are. Well, informal products like, like pulses or ingredients like pulses, you really don't have that. So it, it, it does become a very big challenge when you start working with farmers on, what am I going to pay you for this for next year? You know, and, and then you start talking about, well, is there going to be challenges with weather? Is there going to be challenges with freight? We've seen both of those over the last few years, challenges with weather and freight because of supply. And so, you know, ultimately it has been, it has been a, 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 again, a startup of a food systems approach over the last 10 years. And the great thing is, is that we are formalizing this food system. We are formalizing this for the future. So it will get more efficient. We will be able to grow more consistently. We'll be able to improve the yields of our products to, to deliver more from the field than, than what we currently do today. And so we really believe that we're just, you said it, we're at the, the beginning, the infinite part of this, this journey. The next 15, 20 years, we will see these type of offerings, plant-based protein offerings, be more accessible, be more affordable be more flavorful, nutritious, and at the end of the day, you know, deliver a better experience for the consumer. I'm, I'm, I'm totally convinced of that. I don't see any other way that it, that's going to go. We're, we're, we're not just ingredient, but the industries are, are recognized and the consumer ask, and we're developing the, the systems for it. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys have inspired me to add a feature to our forward features list for 2024, sports nutrition. I was actually quite surprised to realize it's quite a big market for ingredient. I mean, firstly, how do you define sports nutrition? I guess it's a lot broader now, not just performance products for consumers, but you know, consumers who are, have an interest in their own health and well-being. Yeah, I mean, sports nutrition has been, uh, you know, if you think about it, I, I mentioned two legacy uh categories like energy beverage and, and organic, you could probably put sports nutrition in that as well. And I know we were talking offline on the the whole Arnold series on Netflix. And, you know, when Arnold was training, he didn't have sports nutrition like we have today. You know, the sports nutrition that we have today, it's not just that, you know, the GNC, it's, it's, it's everywhere. We can get sports nutrition at pretty much any retailer or you can get it online. And it's, it's a mix between not just ready to mix beverages, but the bars that we consume, the snacks that we consume, even now some of the the, the main dishes that you're consuming have a mix of, of sports nutrition with it as well. So sports nutrition has just exploded, just taken off. Uh, and from from our aspect, from ingredients aspect, it's a space where we see even future growth. As I had said before, are we going to have chairs at the dinner table or are we just going to consume our dinner in a, in a in a beverage in a drink or in a snack it's quite possible and so you know i think that we we would look at sports nutrition as not just the the ready to mix beverages but it could be supplement it can be the the healthy snacks the fortified bars all of this and in now involves sports nutrition and i think we're going to see it even bigger 
I think as we've seen, you know, athletes and their ability to influence uh, brands, you're going to see sports nutrition just uh, participate in a lot more of our day to day. You can just think about how big Messi has gotten mm-hmm. and Tom Brady and the influences that they both have. They, they, they obviously Tom Brady has his own brand. Messi has something very similar as well. These types of brands will just get bigger and bigger, and they'll 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 start coming into our, you know, our 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 front and center with our our dinner table and 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 how we consume going forward. So, it's just it's just uh, very exciting to see sports nutrition. Mm-hmm. Maybe what products are you offering for this sector, and and can you tell me about any successful collaborations so far? Yeah, so we offer some really exciting products here. I mean, our pea protein isolate that we produce out of South Sioux City, Nebraska, that's based in the U.S. That 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 product is works very well in functional form for ready to mix beverages and and a lot of the cold press bars. But what we did, we launched at at IFT. We launched the Institute of Food Technologists had a their national show at Chicago, and we launched there a, a a pea protein isolate and a rice protein isolate blend. And we're very excited about this because what it delivers is it delivers on a pedia cast of one. Uh, pedia cast is the ability for us to digest the protein. And so the a, a one is, if you will, a perfect score. It's the, the, the highest level of the digestibility that you can get for a protein. Many proteins are much lower, you know, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7. So, so to be at one is, is really perfect. We delivered a really outstanding product with this pea rice blend. And many of the sports nutrition companies that we work with we're very excited to see this and have already started to use this in certain types of applications. So, you know, I think we're, we're, we're really, again, looking at how we can bring value to the experience for nutrition. And we know that nutrition for the, the sports nutrition space revolves around digestibility. The more you can digest, the more your body can absorb. And mm-hmm. so that's, that's what we're excited about. We'll have more, more offerings like that in the future. But that's the, let's say, the start of our, our innovation for nutrition. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to be diving deeper into that at the end of October, I think, with Ingredion. And we've got some great panelists on, a, on another free to attend webinar. I think it's on the last Wednesday of October. So, Mike, we've got some uh, final wrap questions for you now. Right. Um, it's been fascinating talking to you. We could probably go on for hours, but unfortunately, we haven't put enough money in the meter to go on for hours. I know you're a firm believer um, that the future is plant based because of the economics. Could you just explain how? Well, the, the economics, I mean, as I had said before, if you think about the, the supply chain that, that I kind of outlined, you know, the, the supply chain is, is just at the beginning. We know that uh, the supply chain of yellow peas, we can formalize better with our growers, with the way that we move it logistically. And ultimately, the yields that we get from our current, our current plants, all of that's going to increase. It's all going to get better. So- you know, we look at over the next five, seven years, those those efficiencies will improve. And we know that ultimately the innovation that we're focused on is going to deliver a better experience in many different applications. And the ones that we're focused on, alternative dairy, alternative dairy bakery and and the snacks. And these these types of products, as I had said, I had alluded to before, you know, the consumers interested, they they are willing to pay more for protein. It has to be the right protein, but they're willing to pay more for protein. So for us, you know, there's opportunities for premium types of offerings that ultimately are able to captivate the the efficiencies that we're building into our our supply chain. So overall, it's it's you know it's building this food system. It's building better ingredients. It's building flavorful and, and nourishing ingredients, and that will all have value. We, we know we're convinced that we'll have value with our consumers. And so, yeah, it does come down to the economics. And as a business leader, that's what I look at. And that's what we look at is, is how do we win the economics long term? Mm-hmm. Now, plant-based is just one pillar of alternative proteins. There's cultivated meat fermentation, insects, molecular farming, et cetera. Um, yeah. Do you pay much attention to developments in these other areas? And how do you think they might converge with plant-based in the future? I mean, it, it is just so exciting. So we, um, we've, we, we partnered with, this is going back to 2019, we invested in a company called Clara Foods. 
which is precision precision fermentation, and they're really focused on the geno or the 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 proteins around egg. So you know we're very excited about about this precision fermentation process and where that's to go in the future. But if you if you look outside of you know precision precision fermentation, there is this such exciting things going on with Taylor Ag, and I think that anyone that's looking at this space closely realizes that Taylor Ag is probably much closer than we realize, and so it is it is very exciting to see. The, the progress that's been made there. I think the next five years, cellular ag is going to just really take off in a few specific countries. Mm-hmm. And it'll be one of those things like, hey, did you ever try that? And it'll almost be one of those things that's, that's put on social media and something to experience when you're in Singapore, something to experience when you're in you know, this specific country. And and people will, will make it one of those adventures. And I, I really believe that Sailor Ag will become much more localized as well. We're seeing it here in the United States as well. There's a lot of little f- groups that are that are popping up that have tremendous offerings. And it's not the the million dollar burger that you heard about, you know, a few years back. They're able to do this and convert, be very efficient at at, at, at very close to animal protein pricing. And so I think it's you know, you're talking about a matter of years here before cellular ag becomes, it may not be main mainstream. I think there's going to be some re- regulatory challenges there, but it will be, it'll be available at fine dining. And once it gets to fine dining, white tablecloth, the future is incredibly bright. Mm-hmm. You know, we already know there's two products in the USA that have been green lighted as it were by the FDA yeah. and the USDA, Upside Foods and Good Meat. And they are indeed in fine dining restaurants at the moment. But I was, uh, I laughed yesterday. I think it was the day before yesterday. I saw another report, <laughs> a customer accusing McDonald's of selling them, selling them a lab grown burger, even though McDonald's haven't even started using it. So <laughs> the, that uh, negative media has already started on the cell ag and, and cultivated meat. Um, yeah, Mike, it's, you know, it's, it's always, it's always that hurdle, Nick, but you know, I think that ultimately people do tend to get past that stuff as well. So yeah. I think it's, it's a hurdle. Yeah, it's clearly not true. Finally, Mike, what are your hopes and dreams uh, for this sector going forward? We know that that population of 10 billion people by 2050 uh, is looming. We know the role that plant-based and other alternative proteins should play. What role do you think they will play? You know, Nick, I got into the space to feed the world. That's something that that, that drives my purpose. I think that um, plant-based proteins absolutely aligns to that purpose. I think it's it's one that fundamentally, you know, you know, yellow pea is 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 fed to the the the, the cattle. The cattle is fed to to us. At the end of the day, let's go directly to the source. So you know, it's it's it is efficient. The experience we can deliver is is very exciting. So I I, I think at the end of the day, it does come back to that idea of, of feeding the world. And it's not there's never a silver bullet in food. You know, it's 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 so culturally diverse. Yeah, it's in specific. You know, I think that that it's another wonderful, these are another many wonderful ingredients that are going to give capabilities and sustainable ingredients for our customers that are ultimately developing the products that do feed the world. So I think it, it does serve a great purpose for many ways, feeding the world, sustainability, animal wellness, nutritious, flavorful offerings. And my, my hope is, is that it continues on the growth that it's that's on six to eight percent that will continue to turn heads and and that it, it continues to stay very creative in the origin that it comes from you know the plant-based space is very you know edgy and different and and creative and startup and entrepreneurial and if it stays on that track i'm i i, I can guarantee that it'll be successful so brilliant that's all we have time for today. Mike, thank you very much for joining us and, and giving up some of your, your time to be with us um, today. It's been a pleasure. Hey, thanks, Nick. Talk to you soon. 